was it? it was Budweiser. They had frogs that would. Oh yeah, Budweiser. Oh yeah, I remember all that, man. <laughs> Budweiser. 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 We were the company that voiced the frogs and put oh, the wow. sound design together <laughs> for that. Yeah. All right, everybody. Uh, hey, Pete, welcome to the Business Line Podcast. How are you doing today, bud? Hey, man, it's great to be here with you. Uh, can't wait to get into our conversation. Awesome, awesome. So you're you're joining us from uh, where are you at? New York, New Jersey? I can't remember. Just out of uh, just outside of uh, New York in Jersey City. Jersey City. Well, I'm in uh, Wisconsin, as some of our uh, fans know, and people who are just joining us for the first time. We're getting hit with a the front end of a blizzard here, so. We're going to be buried by the time we get out of this podcast, but I got a truck. I should be able to make it home. And, well, I'll, I'll you know. be here right with you in, in case anything happens and uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll call the authorities if uh, you start to get snowed in. We just got nine inches of snow. I don't know if that's a lot to you in Wisconsin. I mean, New Jersey is known for being able to take a, a walloping in the winter, but uh, yeah, we're, we're, we're not uh, strangers to that either. I was telling Matt before the show, we were supposed to get like 10 inches a couple days ago. We got rain. And today we're getting it. We're supposed to get between 11 and 17, depending on how close we are to the lake. So we'll see. It'll be fun. Kids will wow. finally get to go sledding and make, you know, forts and throw snowballs at me and push me down. And so it'll be good. Oh, time. the memories. It's great. <laughs> hey, do you have kids? Uh, no, I, I don't have kids at the time. I'm single. But you were a kid once. So you know what I'm talking about. Well, as you're saying that, I'm just remembering all of the forts we used to build and, uh, crawl through and snowball fights and uh now it's it's like we're we're all kept inside more it seems <laughs> you know exactly like right it's like if it was snowing before my parents were up if we knew school was out we were out well you know, my we were... mom worked in the uh school system so she oh, knew yeah, ahead of time before we, we would get the call around five o'clock in the morning uh hey school's canceled and so we, we would get a jump start on the day uh, on a snow day it's so it's so funny. The, earlier this week, so I think it was Tuesday evening, uh, we for for my kids' school, we got uh, a notification: school is going to be out, and all the public schools were out, and everybody was out. And right. the next day comes, everybody wakes up. There's nothing. There's just nothing, and it's raining, but it never gets cold enough for it to stick. And now all the schools waited to the last minute to let let everybody know. It was like crying wolf. No one, right, <laughs> no yeah. one wants to get caught again. Well, letting the yeah. kids out of school. Yeah, I, I imagine it's very disruptive, you know, one way or another. If they if they call it correctly and, and they have to cancel things, probably really disruptive. And if they call it wrong, it's probably even more. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. So we could talk weather all day, but let's get let's get down to business. Tell me a little bit about yourself. Tell our our audience a little bit about who Pete Romano really is, and then I want to learn a little bit about how you got to where you are. Sure. Um, you know, I grew up right here in New Jersey, outside of New York. Uh, I was exposed to a lot of different cultures. I got into art very early. I was, uh, I was a, early on, I was a musician. I picked up uh, drums really early on and just, you know, God bless my parents. Maybe it's because my dad's a little hard of hearing, but uh, he <laughs> let me have a drum set in the basement and would just let me play for hours and hours and hours. And they were really supportive of that. And so, uh, as a kid, I, yeah, you, you might've called me a band geek maybe. And so oh, okay. I, I was playing in the band. I was, I was playing, I picked up the guitar around seventh grade and I was really fortunate to have a lot of, um, uh, support, uh, even, even in, uh, you know, growing up in a very middle-class, uh, area, uh, just by happenstance had a great teacher who, uh, helped usher me into different creative outlets and eventually, went to college for music production. And and that nice. was an amazing experience, being in the recording studio all hours of the day, producing hip hop, producing rock, producing metal, producing jazz bands. And uh, you just learn so much when you're, when you're working with artists and you have this opportunity to just sit there and help make decisions about how the music's gonna come out. I mean, when you're a non-musician or you're just a music fan, you don't know how these decisions get made. You don't know how right. uh, a melody is chosen or a keyboard part or a drum part. And so I listen to music differently than most. 
I, 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 I generally I'll tune out the lyrics, you know, for one reason or another, and I'll listen to the layers and the and what makes this song interesting. And so that was all um, great training because a lot of people ask me, well, how how did you pivot from that into running a software company? Right, and yeah. um, that uh, I I see it as a direct connection. But um, I don't know if that's where you wanted me to go with this. But um, uh, the, I don't either. The, the um, <laughs> oh, I've the, got questions the, just from what you told me. All right, sure. Well, shoot, let, let me hear him. All right, yeah. so let's back it up a little bit. So you got into when you were young. How'd you like? Okay, so you picked up a drum set. Like, rarely do parents like with their kids say, "Here's something that makes a lot of noise." Like you said, your dad was a little hard of hearing. Go for it. Was it just like there was a a rummage sale or a garage sale? So hey, maybe. Maybe Ray, maybe maybe we Pete would like a, a drum set. Let's bring this home. How did you get that drum set in the basement? Wow, that that I mean that that's really breaking it down. And I, next time I'm there, I'm gonna really have to ask them this question because yeah. when I talk about it, I just give them credit. But you just had, you just pl planted an interesting seed for the next time I'm around the dinner table with them. Is like, why did you let me have a drum set again? When I, I was a kid, I would right. bang on everything. Like I right. grew up in the eighties. I, all I did was watch MTV probably should was right. way too young to be watching MTV. And I just thought drums were the coolest. I thought playing guitar, rock and roll was awesome, but I was banging on everything. It was, it was probably ADD or a bit of autism in my brain, but like I was always driving my parents nuts. Everything I did had a sound effect to it. You know, I couldn't move right. my hand or write with my pencil. I love to draw and things like, but I would draw everything had a sound effect, but I was, there was no I was way very... anybody's giving me a drum set. I was very stereotypical. I was, they say you're good at math, you're good at music. And so I was kind of good at both. And I was really passionate. I was re I remember being in first grade, the elementary school band and seeing the bass drummer, you know, typically maybe the least talented of the band members, the least gifted, maybe mm -hmm. arguably, but I just loved this. He just had permission to yeah. just take this huge mallet and <laughs> More than anybody else, he had permission to just swing it at something and not only had permission, but was encouraged and yep. coached to do it. At the, and so I fell in love with that and I found that to be interesting. So by the third grade, they bought me a drum and I just I, I think they were just trying to look out for me. It was something that I was interested in. And they figured, hey, if this keeps awesome. him off the drugs and off the streets, then, you know, my, what's a little bit of noise if our kid's not going to maybe end up in jail? I don't know. That's really cool. So you you said you ended up picking up guitar hold when you when you started playing guitar. So I had a great band teacher, and um, I my brother was four years older than me, and so he him and I early on we would play in the yeah you know, I would play drums, he would play guitar, and but I would always gravitate towards that and begin to strum a little bit. And I had yeah. an older cousin, and so so I'm 44 years old. You I grew up in the 80s. Exact same uh, age as me. Perfect. And so I had a 10-year-old cousin, 10-year-older cousin. And so he was a headbanger, long hair, played in heavy metal <laughs> bands. He was a super shredder and um, Iron Maiden, Kiss, oh, yeah. you know, Overkill, all, all these, but Testament, all, all these old classic thrash metal bands that I would get exposed to. But in school, I, I, I took that. I had that training from being home with the family. But then I got a little bit more formal training in jazz and classical and, and those things. Somebody just, I think, handed me a guitar and uh, uh, started playing some acoustic. Uh, but then around eighth grade, I had another teacher who handed me er an early MIDI system. I don't know if oh, you know. So yeah. a, a keyboard and a computer. And I started to be able to plug in things, you know, notes and into the musical score. And so I was training myself how to write scores for for film and um that's really what you know set me up for this early career in jingle advertising and so i got into uh jingle advertising in new york city found a recording studio that had music producers and uh that was a really interesting place to be because at that time and still now i think i've been out of it for maybe 15 years uh, you end up enrolling in the musicians union. You end up enrolling oh, wow. in actual the the, the, the screen actors guild because yeah. people don't think about this. But if you're a singer on a commercial that runs on TV, you're considered by the union to be an off camera actor. 
And so you're singing in the jingle. You're not on camera at all. You're nowhere near the set, but you're considered an off-camera actor and you, you're entitled, entitled to residuals. And so that was pretty lucrative early on, uh, going up to this, you know, the Screen Actors Guild Union, going up to the Musicians Union, picking up checks for $10, $20, like <laughs> a pile of checks, you know, maybe this high that were all $10, $20, $30, $100 uh, for every time a commercial ran. And so that that was a really interesting uh, early career. That is cool. That is cool. And so you went to college. Where where you went to State University in New York? New York. Precisely. Yeah. So um, at that time, it was one of the only colleges that offered one of these um, uh, studio production programs where they okay. had where they had multiple recording studios uh, in the uh, in the college and. It was on the third floor of the music building, and I think it was on the third floor because that's where they stuck all of the uh, deplorables, maybe you'd say. <laughs> the, uh, so I'll never forget this, being a high school senior and going around touring colleges and being uh, the professor's name was Jim McElwain. Maybe I'm going to have to send this to him to see if he remembers this uh, moment. But Jim McElwain, the dean of that department, was walking us all around, you know, opening the studio to show off the facilities, right? To impress these yeah. you know, impressionable parents, these impressionable high schoolers. And uh, he opens up this studio and, well, what what's on the wall uh, but a, a giant graffiti penis? <laughs> and all of these... All of these parents, uh, you know, it's just like oh, you know, and Jim, God. Jim unwavered because he's an old hippie guy, uh, unwavered, uh, just closes the door slowly and just carries on with his conversation because he just realizes that maybe it was planted there because somebody knew that these parents were all walking around. Maybe it wasn't. Yeah. Maybe maybe he knew it was there for 10 years, but never decided to clean it up. It doesn't matter, but it was there. It's a form of artistic expression, right? It's yeah, artistic right. expression. <laughs> Um, but that was a great education. Um, I started producing records for the, uh, for the students. Eventually I started producing records for the, uh, the faculty there. Uh, they were hiring me as a student, paying me 15, 20, 25 bucks an hour at that time. That's still good money now. Uh, and, um, it was just great training. And, uh, so this it, would have been late nineties, right? 97, 98. 99 yeah, okay. yeah yeah and uh so what was what was the image of you then pete did you have like were you like more grunge long hair uh what what, what did you look like going into the studio to 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 oh, get after it not like i do now i don't think i owned a sweater like this at the time yeah definitely more grunge i was really into pearl jam okay uh, so so i was a blend of uh uh pearl jam and metal so, so I had long hair at the time. I could uh, find some old pictures there. But you were definitely rocking some flannel, right? I had a ton of flannels. Yeah, yeah. I, I probably still have some of those flannels because they because they don't make them like they used to, do they? No, no, and they're timeless, right? Flannels right. are in again for guys. Yeah, I, think right. I got three flannels for Christmas. I used to make fun of my my stepdad because all he wore was flannel. Right, right, especially in in a wintry state like Wisconsin. Right, yeah. right. Red and black flannel and snow boots and snow pants and or coveralls or something. It was, but now I wear them. Now I'm like, give me, give me those because it's comfortable and it's functional. Because you're hip and trendy and you're a trendsetter. Uh, yeah, something like that. At least in my house, sometimes my kids are getting into the tween years, so I'm not as cool as I was a couple of years ago. You got to be a leader. Yeah, you got to be a leader. So, so what was it like in the studio in college? Was it was it all business, or was it was it a lot of goofing around, and eventually some work would get done? What's it like? Uh, I mean, we'll we'll keep this uh, PG. Yeah. So we we've got we can edit. Matt can edit, so we can beep things or you know or cut things out. So, I, but I'm I'm interested. What was it like? Was it there? There were days when um, there were days when I would have. 25 of the top musicians that you'd ever want to work with you know, student um jazz band where they would all be set up and they would just kill it they would i, I would go in set up microphones set up the, the speakers set up everything uh tune them up 
and get behind the booth and just to to be able to capture the power of uh, 30 musicians uh, playing in sync, in tune, playing some yeah. great standards. That was amazing. Uh, but then there would be days where it would be two o'clock in the morning and you'd have class at 8 a.m. maybe the next day and uh, you'd be in the studio drinking and then that was, you know, they were very flexible. You could just get into the building at any point. You could be yeah. running sessions at three o'clock in the morning. And uh, I would have maybe just one hip hop, you know, rapper just on, on mic. And we would just be doing take after take of a verse or a chorus. Um, sometimes I would be sitting there working with the guy who was putting in R&B riffs. There was a guy, uh, the name just came to me. I probably haven't thought of this name in... Uh, 20 years his name was uh randy johnson i think and at the time he was uh excuse me for a second he was just okay. uh, unbelievably talented what was um some of the best musicians some of the best musicians were the the, the black guys that grew up in the church that, yeah. that oh were, gosh the gospel the, background and the oh, gospel yeah. the gospel musicians that came out of the church and then went to music school because they I don't even know the harmony. I'm really good, well trained in harmony and chord progressions. And getting from, yeah, you, know, you can go from one chord to another, and you could call that music. But when they're able to fit in two or three other chords that sound amazing between that one chord and the second chord, then that's where the genius comes in. And these guys were able to just kill it. Uh, on that stuff and, and they were just not the, the formal training was just in the church just yeah. being in the band and they were they were probably just thrown in um as a kid and just had to just keep up probably just i mean i used out. to think about that a lot when i was younger because I, I i i did some music growing up when i was young i didn't stick with it as much and now i do it a lot more now but like i used to think about a lot because like, you would see a lot of um you know, even the eighties, nineties, two thousands, a lot of very famous performers started out, you know, in the church, they kind of moved through and then they, they, they switched over to, you know, pop or, or country or something like that. But, right. you know, I serve, I serve in our worship ministry now. So I play lead and I started out by playing bass and I just, when p things would open up, they would ask me to do things and I'd be like, I don't know, but I can figure it out. You know, cause, cause I can read music. I, I was in band when I was from fifth to ninth grade. And so I played saxophone so I can read music. And then when I was in college, I tried to teach myself guitar and I took a short class and then I failed out because I stopped going to class and, but then I picked it up again, but now I'm, I'm playing again. But if you really want to, to, or if you have a drive, like with anything, you know, if we, when, if, and when we pivot to business at some point, it's like, you got to be willing to put in the time and get through right. the frustration and you know, that flywheel that's not moving and then all of a sudden, just to get it moving is so frustrating. I don't know what I'm doing. I need help. I got to learn. And then the time and time and time and time and time. And then you find the things that actually bring you forward. Then you start, you, you, like, now I don't have to practice for an entire week to learn one song. I can get I can, right. I can get the song down in a half an hour in the rest of the week. I'm just putting together the parts and, you know, you know not perfecting it, but at least mastering it to where it's going to sound good in performance. Everybody, like those, every adult should have a guitar to, to strum. They should all I have agree. some music. Yeah, I agree. Because so much comes out of that. So much comes out of that. And I, it sounds like what you experienced when those folks were, would come into the studio and they were in, well, they were in university and really starting to, let's say, learn the theory and things like that. They had spent 10 to 15 years, two to three hours a day. They had had their 10,000 hours in at least of mastering um, you know, making music, you know, in the soulful way in the church and things like that. And, but that's really cool. What's the, what's the craziest thing that ever happened in studio? That, that, uh, again, you can keep it as PG as possible, but what's, what's like one of those things where you're like, man, I, I, I don't know if I should ever talk about that again. And you can, you can protect the names of the innocent. We don't need to know the exact people. Oh, uh, um, There, uh, uh, I, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not sure. There, there were some older folks that had 
kind of more interesting stories than 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 maybe than I'll share personally. Like, uh, sure, sure. I'll, I'll share a. Um, I know a guy who was the engineer on one of the Guns N' Roses songs from uh, Appetite for Destruction. Okay. And there, there is a there's a part. Uh, I think it's Mr. Brownstone, but maybe, uh, maybe uh, I'm not right about that. Where there's um, Brownstone. I remember that song. Right. I used to Great. listen to GNR. One My the, fourth the, grade picture. I'm in a I'm in an Appetite for Destruction T-shirt with a mullet <laughs> for school. Right. <laughs> one of the best records of all time. Yeah. And one of my friends, uh, I still talk to him. His name's Andy. Um, he lives up in Westchester, New York, and and he had a lot of claims to fame. And uh, he was in on the recording session where in one of those songs, there is the sound of a woman where it's clear that they're making it, that, that there's basically an overdub of what sounds like sexual activity yep. on the song. The, the sound of a female moaning and um you know and in, in any typical recording studio if the artist felt that song called for that sound they would probably just set up a studio mic and just have a female just get on the mic and just kind of fake make it the noise yeah yeah just make the noise make but not guns and roses oh, guns, gosh. guns and roses was uh authentic about about their over, get... about their sexual sound effect overdubs and and he shared that story uh with me and and so i i always remembered that um but but besides that it i wish i had more interesting stories like i i was just blown away by the the virtuosity of people and just how magic can come out of out of individuals when you when you least expect it whether it was a guitar solo or a lyrical uh you know piece there was a uh, there was a guy that um his name was Jesse Colbert and he was about our age and um a guy who was as 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 white and waspy as you could ever <laughs> imagine but trying to be dread and trying to be jamaican in college you know we oh, all kind of wow. knew one of those guys yeah. but he was a brilliant guy and um everybody bought their weed off of him and uh and um and he was just like you said put in their ten thousand hours he was so committed to this and he he had a terrible voice he just had a terrible voice but what he taught me through that was that he didn't care and he just kept going and charging through things and charging through things until he ended up i i produced this this record i still have a copy of it on a cd somewhere and um it was amazing to see somebody who kind of just knew that that he didn't have that particular gift but he had the gift of perseverance and he had the gift of passion and uh, he had one of these voices that was like like almost like an untrained Bob Dylan, like like okay. a worse than Bob Dylan kind of <laughs> voice. And um, but he tried and uh, ended up kind of getting that in order and producing some amazing records at the time. And um, but just a brilliant fella. And he ended up uh, being taken away from us way too soon. Uh. And um, just from some just terrible uh, you know circumstances with the uh, you know brain clots and things mm -hmm. in his early 30s and uh but he was just destined he, he ended up going into starting a business for um tutoring that was making two million dollars before he was 30 and um you know a person that was just really motivating me uh to be better and so sometimes i think to myself well what would jesse do you know were you did you end up being pretty close with him it sounds like oh yeah yeah through, through producing these we had the kind of friendship where uh we you know we can call each other assholes and call yeah. people out on those their, are the best yeah. those are the best those are the ones you need man yeah he yeah he was never shy to share his opinion you know mm -hmm. much to you know rub certain people the wrong way but you know that's what i appreciate about people because if they're doing that, they care, right? Oh yeah. Like, and you could tell, you could tell a person who 
you could always tell a person who is sharing a negative takeaway about you to make them feel better versus sharing a negative takeaway to help you. Oh yeah. There's a very subtle difference there. Oh yeah. Yep. You can, you can definitely tell whether if it's a self-serving rebuke or if it's a rebuke to like, Hey man, you're, you're way outside of your lane here. This isn't good. And I, I it, when you can find people that can do that or you can trust enough some of it's it's a personal thing it's like i got to be to become the type of man who can take somebody criticizing me and then five minutes later sit down and have a drink and you know everything's fine right because it's it's the criticism that we grow in it's the it's the it's it's you know so if, if everybody around you is just telling you how awesome you are you got a problem that's, that's not gonna end well you're gonna grow up to be a douchebag yep absolutely Man, this is cool. So, all right. So you get done with school. You're you're in production. You're you said you got into like kind of jingle work, doing commercials. Can you share a cool jingle that I would know? We were um. Or is uh, somebody going to get royalties if we say it on the, that on the line? We're getting to that age now where um maybe maybe we would be more into this product, but. Uh, maybe not at the time, but yeah. maybe in in the early 2000s, a campaign came out of Pfizer um, for a, uh, a, a like a I guess you'd call it a boner pill. So <laughs> okay, so which um, one now? Now they're everywhere. Now they're everywhere. But this was the original boner pill. And oh, so, so this would have been was the original one was um, the blue know, one, right? Viagra. Viagra. Okay. Yep. That was yep. So, so there was an early campaign, and I forget if there was their first campaign, but they had licensed dysfunction. They had licensed. Uh, I guess was Elvis the original writer on Viva Las Vegas? I believe so. I don't know if he was original. He's definitely the original performer. Right. He had a famous version. So there was a there was a, a jingle a campaign that they launched was the Viva Viagra campaign, and I remember having the ad ad exec uh across and i had my boss at the time and i was the one just holding the guitar trying to strum these chords as the ad exec and my boss were trying to work out the changes because you, know, you got to fit this into 30 seconds yeah and so uh you you try to find well what are the you know when, when you're doing jingle work especially at the time when everything was a 30 second commercial uh, you had to be really clever about what parts of a song you needed to to hit and, and include. And um, because not only does it have to be musical, you can't skip a beat. You can't just edit the song willy right. dilly because it's just going to it's going to fall apart. Uh, and so we were working all of that out. And so we were part of the original uh, Viva Viagra uh, production, which was a. Uh, a good claim to fame there was uh before that there was um do you remember this it was the um was it, it was budweiser they had frogs that would oh yeah budweiser oh yeah i remember all that man <laughs> so it's, i don't know yeah, if so people in my organization at, at the time not me but um were one were, were those frogs and the people so, in the organization were the frogs we were the company that voiced the frogs and put oh, the wow. sound design together for that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that, that oh, was, yeah. I remember those, that was a big campaign. That was huge, huge campaign. Yeah. And I think right after that was the, like the what's up stuff and yeah, yeah. That I wasn't a part of that, but, um, the, um, we did some outback. So like outback doo, steakhouse. Doo, 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 doo. Yes. Outback steakhouse. Yeah. 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 So, um, I played a uh, uh, a few versions of that little. Uh, I don't know if you call it a, a pan flute. Do 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 do. Like uh, that yeah. was their little sound effect that uh, you would know it was an Outback commercial. Yeah, nah. it's crazy. You know, thinking about commercials and jingles as media and television has shifted to so much online. 
And I know they, and here's the funny thing, or there's a couple of years ago is that shift and everybody was so happy because, okay, we're getting away from cable. We can cut that cord. We're going to do apps. Now all the apps, I'm paying for a Paramount Plus app and I'm still getting commercials. So now every couple minutes, I got 90 seconds of back to the jingles and back to the commercials. And, you know, it's like, right. But I have fond memories of that stuff growing up. You know, like I always hated the commercials coming on, but they stuck with you. And then, you know, you've got these. Yeah. And now you would, um, you would, uh, I, I seek them out on YouTube from time to time. If there's nothing else to watch, I'll, I'll try Googling, um, uh, just commercials from the eighties. They're, they're fun to, to, to go down memory lane. Oh yeah. And because they're kind of a part of our past, a part of like our cultural upbringing. You know, the other day I was looking up for some reason, I went down a rabbit hole of old McDonald's commercials. I mean, you know what it was, is my son, he's getting kind of creative. He wants to draw comics and stuff like that. So I got him this cool tablet that plugs into the computer. You can see the screen he draws on it or whatever. And he's got these little characters he's creating. And one of them, I, he calls like harmonica guy or something. And he plays a harmonica, but he looks like Grimace. You know, the big purple blob guy from, from the right? from McDonald's. Yeah, of course. Yeah. None of those little characters are around anymore. And I'm like, that looks like Grimace. He's like, what are you talking about? I remember, I go, remember a couple months ago when they had that purple shake and they called it the Grimace shake? That's Grimace. So I looked up some commercials and started showing commercials. And he's like, those are really creepy. Because there's like Hamburglar and the Fry guys walking around and Grimace. And, you know, everybody thinks clowns are creepy now. So you got Ronald, like, it's so much different. <laughs> the, um, yeah, those characters were insane. Do you remember what was more creepy than him was the uh, and this wasn't that this wasn't that long ago was the the Burger King king with the plastic Yes. Plastic. Yes. How creepy <laughs> the, the big imagine, head king guy. Yeah, imagine turning around and seeing this guy standing next to you as a kid. Yep. You freak yep. out. And is, you tell me is that part of the is that part of the gig trying to find something that's that's kind of right on the edge that that you either think it's creepy or you think it's funny, you think it's cool because that sticks with people. Is that what it is? I was working with my business partner yesterday and he said something uh, interesting about uh, about ad, like digital ads mm -hmm. uh, on a website and things that are going to get you. And, and he was emphasizing that um, you got to make them ugly. You have to make, got to make them ugly to stand out. And uh, everybody's... Mm -hmm trying to go for like it's easy to make a highly polished refined thing and a, as a industry professional in any industry uh you're you're every year you're able to do a higher more polished version of your art and it takes a certain skill set to have that level of training and that level of experience but still do something that's edgy and down to earth. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, uh, I, I think that that's, uh, that's a person who's excelling even further. The, the, the person who's able to do something edgy, that's just edgy in the right way, because there's a difference between just edginess and bad. Mm -hmm. And so there's a certain creative like edgy and janky, right? Edgy and janky. That's a great, yeah. And, and it's, it could have just it could be just the difference between um a logo that's on the left corner versus the right corner or of a certain you know this size versus this size or uh a line underneath something or or not and certain people just have a knack for that and other people maybe nail it by accident from time to time and other people just never are able to do that yeah, it's it is a fine line because I deal with that a lot when I'm talking with my folks uh, here internally and people we consult with when it comes to marketing and creative and stuff. And it's it's this because in the tech world, you know, that we live in, we we have to balance because so much get puts in front of us. It either looks really good or it looks just a bit off. And right now, the trend for the stuff that looks just a bit off is that's got to be something of a scam, right? Like you get this email, you see an ad on Facebook, and it kind of it looks ninety five percent like it's from Microsoft, but right. one of the squares in the Windows logo is just a little janky, and a lot of the times that's a telltale sign of I don't know why they can't figure out how to make it exactly the same because I could do it probably in five minutes using Canva, 
You know what I mean? I've been fortunate enough to work with people from all over the, the world, and it's interesting to see other cultures try to create art for this culture. Oh yeah, and... I deal with it every day. We have we have folks in India and in our offices in India, and it's a right. it's a, a, a it's it can be a challenge for sure. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I. I uh, that's exactly what I'm talking about. I have a team in India as well, a and it's like you can't help it, but you're gonna blend in your uh, culture. You you live. You're immersed in your culture all the time. They're immersed in different color palettes. Their national flag is a is a different color. They don't see red, white, and blue all the time. Every time they look at a stadium or anything, they see browns and greens and earth earth tones. Yep. And so. Yep. Uh, you're when you grow up in in that kind of culture versus our kind of culture. Uh, there's all you could you could just have that little, and it's not that it's good, bad, or wrong, or right, no, or anything. But it, as a creative and in, in service of a client who is expecting a certain kind of output, and and you're using resources from all over the world. Uh, you, like you said, just the positioning of a square or the tilt or the color chosen. Uh, can be a giveaway about where did that version of something come from yeah absolutely so you're leveraging people all over so tell me a little bit about how you how you plug those pieces in successfully in your business and you know because so, so are we like we have you now my business partner is is from india indian citizen and then we have a third partner that's born indian but u.s citizen now so it's a really good blend and i would say 85% of our labor force is over there, super highly skilled in a multiple different places. Um, but we're like, we're building a, a marketing team over there, right? right? And we started doing that a little bit this year and there was a real communication gap and then like artistic struggle. And so we kind of, we're hit, clearing the calculator and rebuilding that. How, it, how have you been able to successfully kind of bring in people from all over and make it work? Um. We could do a whole, you know, semester on this kind of topic. Maybe we will, Pete. Maybe I we will we have to. Yeah. The um, I've been really blessed in our software company, uh, to have to be able to put together a team of people who are invested with their heart in the outcome that we're all trying to get together. And I've heard every form of nightmare from people here in the states who try to outsource or they hire a single developer overseas or they hire uh, and, and they're hiring them for a one-off project or, or it, it took a it took me a number of years to get to a point where we could have smooth collaboration and as a small team you have to rec and the my team works their own business hours they they're not shifting their business hours to our business hours and so uh they're 10 hours maybe 10 and a half hours ahead of us and mm -hmm. so when we wake up in the morning they're already leaving the office and so it's almost like you live on alternate calendars and so um technology over the last 7 to 8 years has made it possible uh more than ever before um, f finding a tool of communications, we we gravitated towards WhatsApp, and we have WhatsApp is huge over there. It's huge, and so we're we're using that to to talk back and forth. Uh, we're sending pictures. I'm sending bugs, etc. Um, but it took me uh, having to recognize that I needed to shift my own schedule a little bit, and um, in order to just like like. You get into this kind of effort with an overseas team and you don't think that you have to make any shift you think oh well things are just going to work out i'm hiring somebody and it'll be fine you think to yourself you know, what 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 can go wrong um but to have opposite calendars to not practice your collaboration collaboration takes practice like when you sure. just like you you have a marketing team over there i have a development team over there if you getting back to the music analogy, you stick a bunch of guys in, you, you know, let, let's say your team is 10 people. OK, well, 10 people, that's a huge band. If you think about it, like, you, you know, yeah. a full horn section, et cetera. 
and you stick 10 people and you even put the music in front of them and they're all excellent individually, but that first rehearsal is going to be awful. Yeah, nobody's listening for each other, right? They're all listening for themselves. They're listening to themselves. They're learning the music. They don't know the tune. They're learning to work together. You're a new conductor. You don't know their, you know, uh, you know, little, you know, um, uh, you know, little personality quirks. And so you have to, you kind of have to let that blend happen naturally. And most people, um, they give up, they don't have the patience for it and their, their heart's not really in it. And then they give up and then the project fails. They don't get their website and then they put a bad review on Upwork. Yep. And that's how most people experience an overseas collaboration. And I've had those when I've had to grow my team from time to time, things that didn't go great. But with my core team, it took us a number of years to get to a point where we can come into a routine and just work on our project and, and have a fluid form of communication. And it took me committing to staying up a little later than maybe I would want to a little bit more often than I wanted to and getting up a little earlier than maybe I wanted to and and working a little earlier than I wanted to. Um, but after that, we have a, a team with as the most part of any development team that I could uh, really hope to put together. Yeah, I could I could echo that feeling that you just expressed more most heart willing to work hard do what it takes to win. That's what I've experienced with our team overseas. And, uh, you know, our, our story is a little bit different. Like my partner, my business partner, Manny and I were introduced by our third partner, Joe, and, um, he had a company in India and he wanted to start a company here. And so we got together, did that. So when we grow our team over there, it's our team, you know what I mean? It's not like we're, we're working through a third party to find us people. And, and it, like, we feel like we're one team, in different parts of the world. So in and, and a majority of our team is working when we're working. We've got some of our team that's working opposite shift because they can do those kind of things, but right. a lot of our first a lot of our folks are service oriented skilled folks that are let's say remote scribes or VAs in another different capacity or um, medical billers or coders or IT support people that they have to be working when our clients in the U.S. need them, right. which is you know, you know, PST, CST, or EST over here. And um, but like I wouldn't trade it for the world. Uh, like getting the only my only regret is that I haven't been able to go over there visit them and really get to know them. Like sitting down next to them because I've got such a young family, it's really hard for me to travel that far and be away. And, you know, I'm not going to drag a two-year-old in a plane 16 hours and, um, but we'll, I'll get there. And, but man, they've, our, our, our leaders, our team, everybody that we've added over there have been nothing but hardworking and dedicated. You know, you come across like you do with anything, people that come and right. go. And, um, but man, I like, I, I, super blessed I, I couldn't imagine have been uh been able to meet the people and have uh, as as many people involved with our successes what we are now you know eight and a half years ago right before we started the company so the uh well i'll, I'll echo that and uh yeah i i have all of the same positive feelings and and, and unlike you i actually have been able to to go visit the the team uh, it was directly right after as COVID was winding down. Okay. And I'm jealous. Man. Um, I was able to to pick up. I got a ticket, and th uh, you. This was a really interesting lesson, trying to get to India. Not for okay. anything you're thinking of right now, but um, it's an interesting lesson. First, the first part, and I'll get into the trip if you want to. But this yeah, first wanna, yeah. way. This first takeaway is, um, as a human in this world, you have a lot of other humans that you don't even think of them as guardrails to your life. Uh, and something comes up in your world and you ask somebody about it. Yeah. And, and you get a piece of information or something else comes in and you're concerned about something. You get good advice from somebody or you get some okay advice from somebody else. Um, and without even knowing it, without even sometimes asking, you're being bumped back 
in line as you go through your day. You're kind of just sure. to stay on a good path. You know, it, uh, in in every stay meeting out of the ditches, right? Yeah, it, it, just to fall. You know, even for simple things like you know, you know, some some small thing. You know, your wife might catch and oh, don't do that. The, the stove's hot, or or, or and and so. Every day, there's these little moments and big moments that kind of keep us. And um, I was so excited to get my you know plane ticket to to India. I went online. I bought the ticket. I told all of my friends I was going. I got advice from a lot of people. And um, I go down to the airport, Newark Airport, and I hand them my plane ticket. And they're like, what are you doing? You can't get on this plane. I'm like, what are you doing? I have a plane ticket. I have my passport. <laughs> they're like, well, where's your visa? Like, what do you mean? <laughs> what do you mean visa? I got a credit card here. With, with... <laughs> I showed up to Newark Airport because I've been to Europe. I didn't, you know, you don't need it. Mm -hmm. Maybe now I think they've changed that. But um, I told everybody that. So I was so embarrassed to... Tell, so so nobody in all of these talkings thought to like remind me like oh by the way did you get your visa your visa they just like, assumed they might not have even known right you might have let me go all the way to you know fly to New Delhi without um, me noticing it <laughs> um so so that was interesting to to go down to the airport have everything already set and then be turned away at the gate for not having uh turned away at security for not having yeah. your visa. So that, that was an interesting lesson in travel. Always look at your local travel plans, wow. everybody out there. Um, but hold, I can just on. feel my face getting red in that situation and holding back a temper. <laughs> like what? <laughs> so yeah, you, so you're at that. You're you just getting turned away. Was it like? Did you just kind of just stoically say, "Okay, turn around and walk away"? Or you're like, "What do you mean? I need a visa." <laughs> There's certain times when you just. You know, there's there's no arguing. Yeah. So I just went home. Uh, I think that day, I drove into New York directly to the Indian consulate to to start to file the paperwork and, and yeah. the visa. And uh, how yeah. long did so, it take so that, you to get it? Two to three weeks. Okay. But it was it yeah, was nerve wracking because you actually I, I don't know if this is how they do it now, but maybe this was a COVID thing. Uh, you actually. Yeah, you know, maybe this is how bad, poorly traveled I am, but you actually have to ship. At the time, I had to ship my passport to them. Really? And, and then get my passport back in the mail, stamped, ready wow. to go. Yeah. Yeah, I'm I'm not very well traveled at all. I don't even have a passport. My my business partner Manny was usually on the couch with me. He's like, he's like, you gotta go get your passport. I'm like, I don't have time, man. <laughs> but I I really recommend going because. By the time I did get there, because I got so I got all that settled and seeing my business partner over there for the first time in person, uh, it just really like melted your brain, like to, to see a person in person that you've only seen on a little screen for so many years, if at all, uh, was brain melting. It was so strange. And I just remember thinking, like, you're taller than I thought you were going to be. You know? <laughs> it's it's weird because I got I got to meet my business partner, like we had lunch at Chili's, you know, the first time we met, and uh, then a couple weeks later we're opening this business. Uh, we hit it off and it worked. But like I can't imagine how did you how did you and your business partner meet and 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 kind of gain the trust that you need because you got to make risky, important, you know, life altering decisions on the on the journey you know, and this person's on the other side of the world and you've never, you know, shook their hand. Yeah. It, it, there's a lot of degrees of trust, but, um, he's probably thinking the same thing about you. Can I trust this guy? Cause right. Well, yeah. And, um, and they know as developers that, you know, they, they know how the systems operate. And so they're, they're in a position of, uh, of their interests being covered. And, um, but it takes the, you know, you have to trust, but verify, you know, whatever it is sure. that, you know, you're in business with, but then, um, just hitting deadlines and calling people back is 
eighty percent of the challenge. Yeah, and, if you can if you can replicate that long enough, you start to build that trust, right? You you start to understand. And they did that very early on, where and and then not only hitting deadlines and calling people back, but showing up to meetings. Mm. But even when something was urgent, and or you felt urgency that a client needed something, and they would rise to the occasion one time, yeah. and then rise to the occasion a second time, or pick up the phone in the middle of the night when it's an emergency. Um, all of that really adds up to uh, uh, some trust. Yeah, there you go. That's t- totally true. You know you've got something good that you want to hang on to. Right. Well, cool. So how... I know everybody, I want to try to ask this in a different way because everybody makes transitions and pivots in life. But like, you just wake up one day and say, I think I want to do a software thing. I've used CRMs and and these all suck. I want to do something better. I mean, what, and I'm going to, you know, look online for somebody who can develop this for me. You had to have had some sort of a, you know, maybe light bulb moment or something. Or did you say, I just want to get into this? Um... I'm really stubborn and uh, just kind of want things how I want them in terms of business. And I had a I had an earlier development team, and I really fell in love with CRMs. Uh, my accountant at the time, when I walked in just crying and moping about <laughs> my business, and he turned his screen around. He's oh, I've been playing with this thing called Zoho. Ah, that's what we use. We use what? Zoho. Perfect. <laughs> I was going to, yeah. Okay. So talk. Okay. Cool. So, so he introduces me to that and I, and I, I immediately take to it and I'm doing triggers and I'm inputting stuff and I'm setting up little configurations. Uh, and it was really interesting for, for a while. But then as I started to want them to do more things, I recognized that as a whole, that tool wasn't everything that my, I was doing marketing like you at the time. Yeah. I was a marketing consultant and I knew that, well, this is a great tool and I can give that to my clients, but they still need phone systems and they still need texting. And I don't really like how it does the email blasting and they still need a website and it doesn't really do anything there. And I need to do this app thing over there. And it's a real pain in the butt here. And I remember thinking to myself that I can pay developers to sync a bunch of stuff all together. And then I wouldn't have anything that I own. And it would still have to be a tons of different software. Or I could just pay developers to build something myself. And that's how I got into uh really development of, of our own tool uh yeah. because i just wanted to have full control over this development environment where i didn't have to be beholden to any third parties to make decisions or wait for some feature to be updated and so segwick was the solution to me seeing as a marketing consultant that everybody needs a customer management type of tool everybody mm-hmm. needs communications and email blasts everybody needs to in every business i mean needs invoicing and quoting every business needs some texting and some phone systems and i just said well if every business really needs all of these things and i was working with a lot of different types of accounts at the time realtors and contractors and mortgage guys and doctors and whatnot I I kind of looked at this landscape and I would put myself into their minds and I would say these all of these people really need the same thing and so I want to have the easiest way to spin up the most value quickly and yeah. that's the where the idea of Segwick was born I just want to make an account and have all of the tools that are necessary for them yeah, and like like I mentioned, we use Zoho, right? So there's a lot in there. So when we started the business, uh, you know, I knew I needed to get on top of CRM and figure out what we want to do because I've I've been a part of some good ones and some not so good ones. And I'm so first thing we did is I looked at HubSpot because Hub, HubSpot had some free stuff and it was allowing us to do it was interconnected in a way that I really liked and 
they they put together a deal for and because uh, I had hired some in, in-house callers to do cold calling and they gave me like 5,000 minutes per caller for $50 a month each or so. It was just ridiculously cheap and I wanted to record their calls and things like that. So I started using right. HubSpot, but then I found really quick that it, it didn't have a lot of the other stuff or I would have had to start paying for their marketing services to get a lot more of their tools. So we I, I got into, looked into, I'm like, I remember Zoho from a couple of years ago, they had a free CRM. Let's see what I can do with that. And I got into there and they had this platform of Zoho One. It was like 40 apps for $40 a user per month. I'm like, it had all these different apps built into it, you know, that I we could use. We didn't need them all yet, but we might at some point. You know, like when we started growing, we were going to need an HR app and something to track time to punch in and punch out. So there was Zoho people eventually and we started using that. And then so we were doing Zoho CRM and we had a help desk. So we started using Zoho Desk. and all. So we started using a bu- bunch of other stuff. But what I found is I'm still at a point where it does all the things it's or that it needs to do. It just doesn't always do them all that well. And so for instance, we've been using Zoho campaigns for a little while to, to send out our email campaigns and track them. And that's some pretty cool stuff, but it's not, it looks intuitive, but it's not very intuitive. Right, right. Right. It looks nice. It's got a good kind of user interface, but you, what I can really, and maybe this is a kind of cultural thing too, because Zoho is an Indian company, you know, they got a really neat little story. And, but when I go in to do something, I'm like, this should go from A to B to C, but it's going from A to Z to D to F. You know, it's, and I'm I'm like, oh, this is breaking my brain and then trying to train other people to use it. And, and then, you know, set up to go into some of their webinars and train them. It could be even tougher sometimes because it's all of their stuff is, is uh, from a video content training standpoint, it's it's out of India and it can be really hard sometimes to, to follow along because they're speaking English and I'm really good at it, but not all my staff can, is really well at, good at understanding now, right? The different dialects and stuff. So it can be frustrating. I mean, it's powerful. It can do a lot of things, um, but yeah, it's still not exactly kind of where I think we want to be long term. Um, yeah, and and for all of those reasons, I'm not going to claim that we've solved all of those user experience problems or that. Come on, man! You say we're the best. Stop it! Stop it. You don't need to be humble. Well, I'm humble. Um, yeah, but um, but I, at least I'm in control of that now, and so I. I don't have to be beholden to wait for their feature uh, that may never change. I can have the programmers prioritize one thing over another to change this or change that. And a piece of software is under constant evolution. Uh, and and the Zoho yeah. environment is very, very robust. But it's probably 90 tools too many for a typical small business. Uh, you know, they, they're just really casting a very wide net and hope that people pick up one tool over over another yep. and uh i i look at their suite of stuff and just you know think to my clients like my clients will probably never use 90 percent of that uh and so you know we're, we're quite happy with the the progress of our uh, development and our tool yeah like there's within it there's zoho there's zoho meetings right we could be doing all of our you know video conferencing if the tools included we have it you know, a bunch of people in the platform but we we standardize on Zoom, like our phone system is Zoom, our our inner office communication chatting is Zoom, and our video conferencing is Zoom. All of our remote scribes leverage Zoom because in their encryption, all that all that stuff. But you know they have a tel- telephony part. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll, so here's my here's my Zoom complaint or my Zoho complaint right now. Like if they have a lot of diff- they have a whole marketplace with a lot of different type of IP phone systems, cloud based will integrate well. Like originally we were on Ring Central worked really well integrated well if i got a call my ring central app would would ring i'd pick it up and zoho crm would pop up that i was on with a client it could tell all that fun stuff and then we moved away from that moved over to zoom and they eventually integrated with zoom but it rarely works properly like for me as a user it works really well i can click the little call button in crm it calls through my my soft phone on my computer and then i do what i need to do and i can be updating crm at the same time works flawlessly but, you know, my my marketer, a couple offices down from me, you know, she's making calls all day long and it's ne- it's not working, right? It's, and you get on with their right. support and they can't figure it out and it's super frustrating. Right. And and again, all these things are going to come up in the evolution of software. 
And yeah. it's great when you're in the position that you can uh, have some say over that. Like um, uh, we're working on uh, like the difference between how we developed versus other tools mm -hmm. is that we've really developed as a service boutique and a software company second. And mm -hmm. so we've taken a small core group of clients and instead of just putting our own development pathway, we've we've contoured it to our clients and went very deep on their particular challenges. And um, and that was an interesting lesson to learn was that if you're going to be a small company, you you can't just uh, uh, rest on your laurels and you say, well, we're this is our development timeline and this is what we're going for. Yeah. Uh, if you want to keep small businesses as a small company, you need to really contour your tool uh, to, to their specific needs. That's are a we... strategic advantage of being small, right? We're the same way. All of our competitors are way bigger than us in, in the verticals we work in. But when we can tell somebody, hey, we can customize this approach and make it just the way you want it. That's general. That sometimes that wins the close right there. Pete, you know, are you a, uh, are you a sports guy? We like to end the what? show on some sports talk. I um I'm a baseball fan. I I'm baseball a, fan. I'm a fan, yeah. I like baseball. You're a Yankee fan. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. Very I'm cool. A Yankee fan. Um, what's your who's your favorite Yankee player of all time? Um, I don't know. Don Mattingly comes. Don to, Mattingly. He, okay. Yeah. yeah. Was you would have been you would have been young when Mattingly was playing. I have yeah, a neat I little story. Part. My my stepdad used to work at a Ford dealership, and in Marinette, Wisconsin, and there was a Marinette guy that ended up playing. His name was. Bob Wickman. He played very shortly as a, a relief pitcher and he got an autograph ball for Bob Wickman, gave it to me, and I immediately, like for about 10 years, was a Yankee fan. So that's a nice little little Yankee story. The, um, when I was in my recording studio days, I'll, I'll share just one quick story. Um, yeah. I didn't know who this person was, but it, I, I knew one of them and not the other guy. Uh, Joe Torrey walked into the recording studio. What? Old, the Yankee <laughs> yeah. from their best run ever and yeah. he was walking in shoulder to shoulder with bob gibson uh wow. which i later learned was uh one of the most beast pitchers of all time uh from my much bigger yankee fan friend greg who was just a you know jaw dropped aghast that i'm in this studio and that i'm not enough of a fan to be bestowed this honor of right. being and i had the honor <laughs> of worthy. joe tory was a cameo cartoon voiceover for a movie i was working on and uh so so he was uh the coach of of a movie where i was doing voiceovers with him robin williams marissa tomei what and, movie was uh, this i'll have to get back to you on it there was uh oh, yes. Email it me. was uh i want to say i know this because all those <laughs> all those all those actors i know right i know it had to have been something cool Anyway, gonna, I know I'll we're really short on time, yeah. Pete, and I, I want more of it. We're definitely going to stay in touch and bring you back because we got a lot more to talk about. Yeah, we um, have a lot to collaborate on. Yeah, talk about. All right. All right, brother. We might be sending you some bad weather. It usually goes west to east. So if you get hit with everything we're getting now, stay safe. Um, but hey, it's been a pleasure. Love talking to you, man. Likewise. Likewise.